eight o'clock. We've been giving people a chance to get into the room and we've been talking rubbish here for the last 15 minutes. So I think it's time we get off to a bit of a start. But before we do, I'd just like to um, to have the chance to welcome my gorgeous Wellfem fellow doctors here this evening. Thank you for giving up your evening to join us and answer a few questions. Um, if you if you wouldn't mind, maybe just say uh, a few words about who you are and why you're interested in menopause and anything special you'd like the ladies to know before we start. Anna, how about we kick things off with you? Uh, so I'm a GP on the Gold Coast um, and I've been interested in women's health for a number of years now. So I work um, as a GP, but I also have um, a job at the Gold Coast University Hospital working with um, women with heavy menstrual bleeding and um, issues with the vulva, so um, vulval skin conditions and um, myrena and issues around bleeding and problems around that. Um, and I'm interested in women's health because I just really like helping people and empowering women to seek the help that they need. And I find that there are often women who aren't getting the help that they particularly need. And in terms of special interest, um, as a ultra um, runner and as a lifelong exerciser, I think probably my special interest lies in that area. Prior to medicine, I uh, did a, a physical education degree and did some study in sports medicine. So that's probably one of my special interest areas. But really any interest in women's health, uh, it, sort of any area of women's health um, is is an interest of mine. So that's, that's my little verb. Thank you. And uh, Marita, um, so those of you who saw our recent Dementia and Cognitive Issues webinar would be familiar with Marita. Why don't you tell the rest of us who you are, Marita? So I'm a GP based in um, Melbourne and um, like Anna, have always had a strong interest in women's health. I was actually late to medicine. I did nursing for 20 years before medicine. And so I've got a strong paediatric focus also and, you know, women and Babies tend to go together. Um, being a middle-aged woman, of course, you attract, you know, middle-aged female patients often. And I guess one of the things I um, really try my hardest to do is to listen to women, to try to hear what they're telling me, because I think often that's um, an experience a lot of women have that they feel that they're not they're not really listened to. Um, so that's what I try really hard to do. I don't know the answers to everything. Um, but I'm always very committed to finding out things for, for women. Um, and, yeah, my special interest area is dementia. I've been a medical educator as well as um, a clinician probably for the last eight or nine years I've been doing medical education, and a lot of that's been in the space of dementia education, and I'm very passionate about that. And I see menopause as a great opportunity for women to start to make the lifestyle changes to set them up for a good long life. Mm. Perfect. And I totally relate to what you're saying there, Marita, about not having all the answers. None of us do. Um, you know, I think that's the beauty now of what I'm loving so much about um, being a collective of doctors here in Wellfem is that we are able to learn from each other and consult one another about, you know, tricky situations. And um, so I'm hoping to learn a lot tonight as well from you all. Dr. Katie, why don't you introduce yourself? A lot of women have already met you before on some of our webinars also. Yeah, hi, so I'm uh, Katie Kent. I'm also a GP um, with obviously an interest in women's health. So I moved from the UK three years ago and in England I worked in sexual health and contraception clinic. Um, so my background has always been in women's health, um, but it's kind of evolved into menopause, um, which is now an area I really enjoy because it there's a, there's a need for it and um, we can really, as, as the others have said, have, have time to listen to people and make a difference. So, um, yeah, it's really good working for wealth and being able to do that too. And they love you as well. I'm getting, you know, so many women have been loving all of you guys and, and feeling really listened to for the first time, so that's fabulous. Linda, hello, Linda. Linda was also hello. on some of our recent webinars. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, yes, yeah, so my name's uh, Linda Newman. I'm a GP. I work in Canberra. Um, I've got an interest in uh, preventative health, so I tell the, my paradigm is to keep well, people well. And I suppose I see a menopause as a really pivotal time where you can make um, you can age well, or you can you can make health choices that can make you age well and age in a healthy way. So we'll get old. Um, we get older. We're all getting older all the time. Um, and so I've become more and more interested in it as, I suppose, a, 
um, a way of keeping people happy and well. And um, no, I do very mainstream general practice where I do complex chronic conditions. And then I like the flip side as well, where it's well people and how do we keep them as well as we can. So that's me. Mm. So as you can see, girls, I've got a fabulous bunch of doctors here um, and it's so wonderful to, to have them working with me and to meet most of you all in, together in Adelaide for the, um, the recent Women's uh, Menopause Congress in Adelaide. Um, so that was fantastic as well. We got to hear the latest news and evidence about menopause <coughs> and, um, and HRT and all those sorts of things. So hopefully a lot of our knowledge is fairly fresh at the moment. Um, I do want to say before we start that we can't give you any individualised medical advice in this forum, so just please keep it general, keep your questions general. But, of course, if you want to book a consultation, we'd be more than happy um, to assess you on an individual basis anytime. And the information that we're providing is for informational purposes, um, so don't try and apply any generalised information to yourself or your specific medical information without the doctor's supervision. Um, so first up, thank you all so much. The reason why we wanted to run this webinar was as a bit of a thank you, something a bit more casual so that you could all um, kick back with us, get to know us a little bit and, um, and also get some of your burning questions answered. But it's a way of us thanking you for the support you've been giving us for the last couple of years, you know, without all of you lovely women um, telling your friends about WellFam and you know, getting behind us, you know, registering for these webinars, we really couldn't do what we do. And towards the end of the webinar today, I'm going to say a little bit more about that and how you might be able to help us going forward to keep WellFem strong and doing what we do best. So for now, let's kick off some questions, I'm thinking. How are you girls ready to go? All right. Yep. Okay. So what was the first question, Anna? You had one lined up that was a very good general question. I think the first question was, does menopause end? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think when many of you are in, in the state of menopause, you, you wonder if it's ever going to end. And, and the answer is, is um, yes, it does end. I mean, menopause is defined as your last menstrual period. Um, 12 months from the last menstrual period. But I think the point to remember is that the perimenopause is the state of the hormonal flux and that can last on average for five to seven years. And then the menopause is sort of officially defined as that 12 months after your last menstrual period. So um, the average age of menopause in Australia is the age of 51. Um, but it, it, it does end it's just the fact that for many women um the, the 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 symptomatic time is when there is this huge fluctuation in symptoms and when both estrogen and progesterone levels drop and become low many of the symptoms actually settle for women there is a small proportion of women who will continue to get symptoms as they get older and do need to continue on with hormone therapy as they age and get into their 60s and and and, and older on and older but for many women as they get through that kind of perimenopause and into their early 50s or late 50s often they don't need to continue on with their menopause therapy because of the fact that it's the fluctuation and the ups and downs in their hormones that's the thing that gives them the most symptoms and the effect on their quality of life. So that would be what I would answer in terms of that question. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, okay, brain fog was the next one that was on the list from Anna. Um, that's your department, Miss Marita. <laughs> So brain fog is a commonly reported symptom for women in menopause and um, the good news is it's not a marker for a dementia. It doesn't mean you're going to end up with a dementia. We do know that the brain fog associated with menopause does settle down um, and really what it's about is, is that your, your, your brain as well as your body is actually in a transitional period. So whilst you're going through the menopause transition, your brain's also rejigging itself around because there's often a big a big change in role. And we see the same thing at puberty and the same thing when we become pregnant. Our brains are able to adapt, but in order to become adaptive, there needs to be a few changes. So there's actually parts of the brain that 
I guess for want of a better word, we often relate a lot of these symptoms to, to gardening. So it's like a part of your brain just getting pruned back a bit and you can sort of offload some of the information that you may not need anymore because you might be through parenting, you might be preparing for grandparenting or you might be um, preparing yourself for a life beyond children where you can go off and do some of the things you've really wanted to do. So you've got a pruning back. That's when you're in that brain foggy phase. Mm -hmm. And then what happens after we prune a bush? It just comes back and it blossoms and blooms and things become better. And there's a terrific doctor in, um, she's either in the States or Canada, Canada called Jen Gunter. I think it's the States. Mm -hmm. And she likened the brain fog to what happens when you reset your iPhone. You know, when your iPhone starts to run out of battery all of a sudden and the apps are closing and shutting all the time and then your phone has an update and everything looks new and difficult and confusing and then all of a sudden you've got this fabulous new phone with great new apps and better battery storage and something that's more functional. So that's really what brain fog is about. It's not a marker of dementia. That doesn't mean it's not unpleasant while you're going through it. The sad news is that um, the the hormone therapy that we give you often doesn't fix those symptoms. It's a time thing. But if you get better sleep through the treatment, the brain fog will be a little bit better. Mm. I just, when you were talking about the pruning thing, I'm having visions of like, okay, all those names that I always forget have all been snipped away. And I think they, they've just blown away in the wind. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got a bunch of really good questions coming through. I am scrolling back to more towards the beginning. Um, so one of the questions was about the um, what's the latest findings with regard to hormone therapy and cancer. I wonder if any of you doctors there would be um, happy to dredge up some of that lovely information from uh, last weekend at the menopause conference about that. Um, I missed that whole afternoon. Kelly, because I had to go somewhere else. <laughs> so I think Katie should do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is, it's quite interesting. There's a lot of ongoing research into, into this, especially with the newer um, transdermal estrogens and um, more micronized prometriums. The general thinking is that with um, the estri transdermal estrogens and micronized uh, prometrium, there's a lower rate of bre breast cancer um, instance than with the uh, more traditional oral HRTs in terms of combined HRT. But otherwise, it's actually there's a lot of evidence it's protective against bowel cancer, um, some endometrial cancers. Um, uh, and, you know, so there's lots of protection there as well. It, it's no difference in terms of cervical cancer. It's a different mechanism. So it's got no bearing on that. Um, it's thought that the micronized progesterone, the prometrium, is safer. It's known to be safer at least up to five years. Beyond that, there aren't that many studies being done, but overall it's thought to be safer in terms of breast cancer. It's quite a broad topic. Mm. Do any of you have anything it to is, add? Yeah. To I, I, I read an interesting article I think I shared with you guys. Um, it was written about, you know, it was sort of an overview of um, whether or not giving HRT or MHT in, under the circumstances of people who've had different types of cancer and whether that was okay. And they classified the different types of cancers as, as being beneficial, neutral or harmful. Um, and, you know, overwhelmingly, of course, the, the hormone-sensitive cancers, as you'd expect, the ones that have estrogen receptors and stuff are the, are the main problem. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that there's also um, a lot of potential benefit um you know even with the with some of those treatments someone I, uh, sorry go okay. ahead Emma. i was just going to say um one of the things just in answering that is that for many of you mm -hmm. um you will use a myrena as part of your hrt and so a myrena is protective against endometrial um, cancer and so um, as we know um, Australia has a obesity issue and unfortunately many people do gain weight in, in relation to perimenopause and menopause and obesity is one of our biggest risk factors for endometrial cancer and a myrena is protective against that so that's one thing to consider if you're mm -hmm. thinking about using a myrena as part of your HRT as the progestogen component of it and then the other thing to remember 
remember is that if you're using, if you've had a hysterectomy and you're using estrogen only form of HRT, that actually you have a lower risk of breast cancer if you're using estrogen only HRT compared to someone who is using estrogen and progestogen combined in terms mm. of breast cancer. Mm. So um, there's a lot yeah. of concern around breast cancer in HRT. And if you're using estrogen only, you have a lower risk of breast cancer compared to someone who doesn't. Absolutely. I don't think that point is made often enough, is it, that, you know, when they talk about MHT and breast cancer risk, they're not all the same. The different products all have very, very different risk profiles. And um, Celia asked here, Katie, could you please spell the HRT that you just said was safer to use? Was that Prometrium you mentioned? Prometrium. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's basically body identical progesterone cilia. And um, so when we're using um, estrogen plus something to thin and stabilize the lining of the uterus known as a progestogen, the two safest kinds of progestogens with respect to breast cancer risk uh, have been shown so far is Prometrium, micronized progesterone and uh, Marina, as Anna was just telling us. Okay, so we've got loads of questions here to get through. Oh, and my it's goodness. It's important to remember that every woman's risk is different. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, when we're talking breast cancer and breast cancer risk, you know, being a woman, you're at risk of breast cancer, you've got breast. Getting older, you're at risk of getting One breast cancer. One in seven, apparently. That's yeah. right. And, and mm-hmm. as Anna said, being overweight or drinking too much alcohol, smoking, all those things increase your risk. Not enough you're exercise. <laughs> Sorry, not enough exercise. Yeah. So, so, and then you've got your own family history. So it's a very sort of detailed look at um, weighing up those risks. But for the most part, the message you want to say is that for most women, it is safe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's safe if started around the average menopausal age with no contraindications. Um, okay, Linda, this one might be up your alley. It's a question yep. related to weight and the menopause. What's the latest information on weight and menopause? And there's, there's a lot of women who've come in here with um, comments after that saying that they have just can't shift their weight and their, their weight's crept on. Yeah. So um, as Anna said, there's a huge problem with um, increasing weight and obesity in Australia. So each year we put on something like 500 grams, might be slightly less, but it's an extraordinary amount of weight each year. So we just get fatter and fatter and fatter as we get older. Now around menopause, your hormones change, so your distribution of the fat that you have um, also changes, so you put around your middle, which most most women really do not like, um, and your muscle mass uh, drops. So you're getting chubbier and you're changing the fat distribution. So it's really, really hard to sort of, we have to make an effort to uh, sort of slow that or stop that. Um, so I suppose I tell women that even if we keep your weight the same through the perimenopause and menopause, we're kind of winning in, in the scheme of things. Um, but it would be nice if people could be the weight that they were at 25, and I, I truly believe that they can be. A lot of weight is about what we eat. So where um, 80% of weight is uh, diet is sort of responsible for about 80% of the weight gain, and you can uh, and you can decrease the weight gain by diet. And you know it's a huge component of it. And exercise is really important, um, but that's a smaller part, about 20%. So we have to work really, work really, really hard at maintaining the um, same weight or decreasing. And it's about diet and it's about, I mean, it's my belief that it's about changing the ratio of one eating smaller portions, but before you even think about that, changing the ratio of what you eat. So when you eat carbohydrate, your insulin goes up. That's the job of, in, uh, well, as a reaction, uh, carbohydrate goes into the cell. That's the job of insulin get hungry, eat again, you get this sort of cycle. So what you have to do is you have to try and stop that cycle. Uh, the insulin makes you really hungry, so that's the in- insulin sort of theory of weight gain. So you have to try and stop that little cycle by eating slightly different types of food. So you have to increase healthy proteins, increase healthy fats, decrease sugar, decrease carbohydrates, and you'll find that your set point, what's called a set point, drops a bit and your weight will become more stable. So there's lots about that and um, it's a bit, it's a tricky time. Um, 
HRT or MHT as it's called now, uh, does sort of revert the weight distribution back to that when you were sort of 40, so changes from your tummy back onto hips. So that is, um, you know, part of an approach, but that's kind of not where it's really at. It's, it's really about what we eat and the activity we do. And the activity level that we um, have as we get older also decreases. And that um, means you're burning up less calories, your insulin uh, resistance, um, or insulin sensitivity goes down, and you put on weight in that way. So it's multifaceted, but it's, um, I personally think it's very, very important to try and maintain the same weight and not to keep putting on weight. Because the more weight you put on, the less you can exercise, the more unhappy you feel, you know, the more you're at risk of breast cancer. Breast cancer risk is doubled by being overweight, by being 20 kilograms overweight is a huge increase mm. um yeah so happy to ever talk to any of the peoples about that it's one of my pet topics and I've yeah got you, really you do some things. really great counseling for i know some <laughs> patients that have um really benefited from having just specifically counseling sessions with you for their weight haven't they um so yeah that's that's really important isn't it and it's the it's not just the risk of breast cancer but the risk of heart disease and um dementia and all other things you know just um and that increase yeah. in weight so what you were talking about there linda that was very interesting about the you know having to drop down your amount of carbs to offset the insulin response there so what do you yep. think about intermittent fasting and that sort of thing? I've been dabbling with, with that a bit myself and talking to some of my patients about that to do that role where you've got cut right back on the carbs and maybe do some low calories a couple of days a week or something. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good good idea. So if you look back in time, you know, our food pyramid, which is really carbohydrate heavy, um, that sort of really heralded it the onset of this big type 2 diabetes um, issue that we've got. And so I always worked in ED emergency until 2016 and I was absolutely shocked when I went back to general practice how much diabetes there was. I was absolutely shocked. The more people who are insulin resistance in the U resistant in the US than they are that aren't. And, and that's, mm -hmm. um, if you delve into it, and the patients sort of taught me, you know, they told me all these funny things that I sort of started reading and, um, if you delve into it, um, you know, it does um, coincide with that sort of, you know, focus on carbohydrate. Mm. So all the patients, um, and where I work, the patients are pretty smart. <laughs> the ones that sort of lost weight and maintain lost weight sort of drop their carbs, um, decrease their insulin response, um, and they just lower the, their set point. So the other way of decreasing insulin by um, not eating, and so that's where intermittent fasting comes in. So if you don't eat for 12, say, to 16 hours, which is not that long, so that might be from 8 in the morning till, you know, 10, sorry, 8 at night till 10 the next morning or 10 at night till 12 the next morning, that's not actually that long. Um, for the period of time that you're not eating, your insulin is really low, and um, at during those times, you're not hungry, you can easily break down fat, you're not laying down fat and you're improving your, your insulin sensitivity. So you need less insulin to do the same job. So mm. it's about minimising your insulin and you'll find that if you minimise your insulin, you lower the set point where your body wants to be and your weight just goes down to where it wants to be. It might go down 5 kilos, it might go down 20, it might go down 3, but it, it goes down. And then it just sits there. And then if you want to, you're not hungry. Because the thing is, if you lose weight by just dieting, you might get down from 70 to 65 kilos. And then you're just hungry the whole time because your body wants to be 70 kilos. You've got to sort of change something about what your body wants. And it's about insulin is the driver of hunger. There are mm. there are other hormones that are drivers of hunger, but um, insulin, I think, mm. is the main one. Anyway, the, mm. the patients taught me that and, and I... I sort of became quite interested in it. So, yeah, like, yeah. I, there, there's some really good books. I've seen it on your bookshelf, The Obesity Code by Dr. Victor Fung mm -hmm. is one of those. Is it Victor Fung? Or, it's um, Jason. Victor Jason. Fung was a cardiologist. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's right. Jason. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and also those Michael Mosley ones, The Fast Diet and things and the mm -hmm. range of documentaries he's done are fabulous as well if you're yeah. interested in thinking about that some more. Um, okay. I think on we can get away from... I'll just quickly get away from it being a diet as being a lifelong sort yeah. of lifestyle. Yeah, it really is. The important thing 
because weight, being overweight is a um, really it is a chronic disease. Mm, mm. You know, it's not something. Yeah, well, it confers common. a lot of health issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like so, I don't you know, know, Marita. I, I don't know because it's. I mean, I've got uh, some page. I've got a lady. She's a hundred. You know, she went from one hundred and sixty-four to one hundred and forty-four. She might be one hundred and thirty-four kilos now. And um, she can't lose more weight. Like, she just can't. Uh, you know, she's done the keto. She's done the fasting. Um, but to keep her. that weight to keep that weight off for her, it's, she has to keep doing what she's doing mm. or she will regain. Yeah, I, think I, get, yeah. I think I get your point is that, as I say to my patients, it doesn't really matter what works, what like what it is that you do, as long as you can do it consistently, doing it. sustainably. Yeah. It's built into your lifestyle. Some patients yeah. will benefit a lot, as we saw at the Congress, also from bariatric surgery. Sometimes that is the thing yeah. that gets them over the line to really lose a lot of weight so that they can, from a healthy start point, then move on with their lifestyle habits. Um, yeah. Okay, moving on from that jars for the moment, um, a couple of people were talking earlier about their itchy fannies in the chat box and um, how they're getting chronic itch down below. That sounds like a Dr. Anna question to me. <laughs> yeah. She's our vulval specialist over there. Um, how do you, what, what do you think, why do you think that women get um, more itchy vulvas and things uh, after menopause? Because it's not always about thrush, is it? And a lot of women no. get fobbed off by doctors who yeah. don't even look. They just no, say, so I think oh, my best good. advice is yeah. make sure you get examined. And, and I think so many women self-treat. So they go to the... They go to the pharmacy and they think that they've got thrush or they tell the pharmacist about their symptoms and they're presumed to have thrush and they get treated for thrush um, and they're never examined or they tell their GP and they're not examined or the GP perhaps does a very cursory exam and they're not actually diagnosed officially with what the issue is. So if you don't have a GP that's actually done an examination, try again and again and again until you find a GP that actually examines you and does a proper detailed examination. And that means that you actually need to have swabs done. And that's looking for thrush, but it's also looking for other infections. Now, that would be excluding sexual infections, and it's excluding other non-sexual infections as well. Now, things that itch in the vagina or the vulva could be thrush, but it could be types of dermatitis, and then it could be skin conditions like lichen sclerosis. Now, lichen sclerosis is a very common cause of vulval itch, and in a number of women that I see in my clinic at the hospital who have had years and years and years of chronic vulval itch who present who have been told for years and years and years that they have thrush or some other form of, of itch, but actually it's it's lichen sclerosis. And the treatments are completely different. So examination is the key for this. But we know that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which is a fancy way of saying um, the symptoms that you get related to low estrogen with menopause, and that's vaginal and vulval dryness because of the lack of estrogen, can cause itchiness and dryness of the vulva. So it may simply be some dryness related to the low estrogen, and that may cause a bit of itch. And that should settle with using some vaginal estrogen, such as Vagifem or Ovestin, either as a pessary or cream. But that should settle very quickly with treatment. It may respond to some vaginal moisturiser, which you can buy over the counter, such as Replens, for example, and using some, um, some uh, uh, lubricant if you're sexually active. If you have itch and it doesn't settle very quickly, if your doctor is using vaginal estrogen and you're using a vaginal moisturiser, then it's not related to that and you need that examination. It needs to be excluded. Lichen sclerosis, for example, needs to be excluded. Thrush, chronic thrush and other infections and other dermatitis need to be excluded. General vulval health and vulval skin care. The vulva does not need soap. Okay, wash your vagina and your vulva with water alone. It does not need soap. It does not need douches. It does not need any feminine hygiene products. Be very, very careful with toilet paper. So use plain toilet paper, not scented toilet papers and things. Tight underwear, tight pantyhose, tight trousers. The vulva doesn't like those things particularly when you're going through menopause and you've also got some dryness related to the lack of estrogen. 
So having time, particularly um, in the evening and overnight, wearing no underwear or loose pyjamas or a nighty, cotton underwear, not nylon, um, and making sure you dry properly, particularly after you've had a shower, would be my sort of general advice um, around Volvo health and Volvo skincare. No moisturisers, the Volvo doesn't need those things. Mm. Thank you. That's excellent advice. And that a lot of that advice is common to all age groups because it's amazing the number of, you know, young teenage girls and even little girls who have bubble baths all the time that get yeah. really itchy yeah. bulbers as well. Yeah, so, but, yeah bubble baths and feminine, feminine wipes and all of those products that are marketed to improve the smell are things that will make the vulva worse and cause more mm. irritation. And if you need something just to sort of improve, you know, how the vulva feels in addition to using, say, Veggie Femme, for example, just using a plain bland um, cream like pseudo cream, just a plain nappy cream um, can be very helpful. Mm. And for any, there was a couple of questions earlier about vaginal dryness and pain. Um, I would point anyone who wants to hear it about general issues around vulval pain um, and sexual pain at least to have a look at our webinar that I did with my friend um, Marita O'Shea, who's a pelvic floor physiotherapist. We did one last year. It's on the blog page entitled Sexual Issues Around Menopause or Sexual Problems at Menopause and the webinar is embedded in the blog post. So um, there's some really good advice about using different types of lubricants and um, the role of vaginal estrogen and um, what sort of management's available for vaginal and sexual pain. So check that one out. Now I'm thinking about, why don't we do some rapid fire here, girls? I've got a few questions lined up here that I think we should be able to answer in one minute or less. So that's your challenge. I'm going to throw a question out there and I'd like each of you to maybe take a turn in answering in about a minute or less. Uh, let's see, there was one I saw here before. Um, why is it so hard to get a script for testosterone? Any comments? It's a one in hour. One, in one minute. <laughs> one hour webinar. Why is it so hard? Why, why is it important that it's, you know, done carefully? I think the answer to that is that um, a, lo a long-term use of testosterone is a little bit of an unknown quantity. There's not so much research on it in women. And um, women should be adequately estrogenized before they have testosterone to treat their symptoms. So sometimes when we see women in wealth and they're like, oh, I really want testosterone, but they haven't got enough estrogen on board. So until that's kind of optimized, um, then we might consider testosterone, but we don't jump into it. It has to be monitored carefully because you can get uh, enlargement of your clitoris. You can get a deepening of your voice, which is irreversible. Um, you can get hairy patches on your skin, increased hairiness. Um, so it needs to be very carefully monitored. It's not just a matter of going on it and, and suddenly feeling better. Um, is that under a minute? Did I... Yeah, yeah, perfect, yeah. yeah. I, and I think the other thing is that women always have these great expectations that it's going to fix their libido, but we'll have the libido discussion later because that's a lot, the libido is way more complex than just throwing some testosterone at it. Um, will this recording be available? Yes, I answered that one in under five seconds. Um, okay, what about vaginal odour in menopause? Um, I think you've already answered that one really, Anna, because, you know, really if people are using the incorrect products, if the pH of the vagina is out of whack because of that, they can get bacterial overgrowth and smelly vagina and that's why they tend to go and use more of the smelly products that makes it even worse. Yeah, um, I think it is important just quickly under one minute mm, to yeah. note that often women do report there is a change in odour and I think that's what, they talk a lot about it. and it's a change it's a part of a change in the biome of the vagina so there's different different balance of bugs then and it's 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 something that women are acutely aware of but if you asked anyone around them they would not be aware that there was any odor but it causes a lot of distress so again listening understanding and talking about it is important absolutely good advice um right can implanon be used to protect the uterus no no. Yeah. I mean, you know, the answer is I don't think the studies have been done, but it's certainly not validated and we don't prescribe it. Um, so therefore, if you have an implant on and you want some estrogen, we're still going to have to give you another progestogen. Um, right. Can HRT be used indefinitely? The body identical one they've. Um, so that's from Tara. Any comments? 
I would say under a minute, yes, with um, proper um, monitoring. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the evidence so. shows, as I understand it, that as, as long as it's initiated um, in a woman who's around the age of onset of normal age of onset of menopause um, and it's used continuously from that time uh, that it is you know quite safe and of course you know you've got the other factors there like is it transdermal estrogen so it doesn't have the increased risk of unwanted blood clots because I wouldn't choose oral estrogens over the age of 60 for that reason Um, also are we using the safest type of progestin to reduce the minimize the risk of breast cancer so um, yes um, but definitely you know in a woman who still gets dreadful symptoms at the age of 75 or 80 every time she tries to wean off her HRT, I'm not going to take it away. As long as everyone understands and you get a doctor who will talk you through what the risks are, you know what the risks are, what the benefits are, yes. Absolutely. And this remembering this is all individ, this is all generalised information and we can't individualise it unless we do an assessment of an individual woman's medical situation for sure. Okay, can we explain uterine cramps post-menopause? So why is it that women still get uterine cramps if they are not having periods anymore? Hmm. Hmm. I'm I'm not sure about that one. (laughs) Yeah, I think Hmm. often things that are mistaken for uterine cramps may actually be bowel cramps. Um, but I don't discount the possibility. I mean, the, the uterus is a big muscle and if it gets irritated by anything, it's going to get crampy, but it just may not be ovulations or actual periods that are doing that. Mm. Mm. Yes. Sorry, we can't give you a better answer on that one. We failed you. Sorry. I suppose the only thing I can think of is if someone's on oestrogen without a uterus and perhaps, well, they wouldn't be getting uterine cramps then, would they? I'm just thinking of women with endometriosis who might have endometrial tissue in other places. Yeah. I do get yeah. women who are on HRT and still still say that they get cyclical mm. kind of types of cramps yeah. but without the bleeding sometimes too. Um, so I'm not yeah. quite sure what the yeah. mechanism of that is. Interesting. Post-ablation, if you've had an ablation, you can get the odd cramp um, without bleeding as well, just because you know, all, there's a little bit of residual endometrial tissue or, or whatever. Um, but in, in general, post-menopause, you think they would settle down as a general rule. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, this question, um, I'm thinking of you for this one, Linda, actually. Um, what foods are best to help increase estrogen levels naturally? Because I know that you have a handout that you like to give your patients about that. And there was also a question about foods for calcium, best foods to prevent osteoporosis. So that's a bit of a two-part one. So you can have two minutes if you like. Oh, no, no, I'll just have one minute. That's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, there are plant estrogens and, um, you know, soy is um, a good source of plant estrogens, so tofu, tofu or soy mm. milk. Um other um, foods on that list are, uh, you know, onion, garlic, like they're all healthy foods. Flaxseed's another one that sort of comes up quite high, but it's really around soy. And it just, uh, so um, uh, hummus is another one. Look, it just, I mean, it's just an attitude about um, healthy eating and perhaps trying to empower you to do something for yourself. And there was that trial that they showed at the conference where I think it was something like a cup of soybeans a day is quite a lot. It mm. increased your vasomotor, so your hot flushing, by 50%. And I mm. think they dropped their weight by about three kilos as well. And that was over a very short time. It might have been eight weeks. But that's an awful lot of soybeans. So I guess I just supply the rest of estrogen-rich foods. Just, you know, I, I see it as all part of a puzzle. Healthy diet, exercise, estrogen-rich foods, you know, supplements if you want non-hormonal meats, hormonal meats. So, and then the women just choose what they want to do. That, that's kind of what I think. Um, mm. Calcium, I'm afraid I just have a handout <laughs> as well. Mm. And uh, women need, uh, postmenopausal need uh, 1,250 milligrams per day premenopausal or peri- even, I mean, uh, perimenopausal as well is 1,000 milligrams per day. And there's just a list of foods I can perhaps send it to you, Kelly. And you could okay. post it somewhere. 
And yeah, I, I have put one on Facebook before, but it's probably been a while, so we could do that do that again. Yeah, it's just got pictures of different foods and how much calcium they have, and I just um, ask women to sort of add up how much calcium they have, and it doesn't if it doesn't come to the required amount, so one thousand milligrams premenopausally, one thousand two hundred fifty milligrams postmenopausally, then just to take calcium tablet because in the mm-hmm. and you must also make sure that their vitamin D is adequate. Because vitamin D increases the absorption or enables the absorption of calcium. So if you haven't got enough vitamin D on board, then you're not going to absorb the calcium. So you must, um, I mean, I measure that in general practice. Um, but um, if you're talking just about calcium, just try and get through your food. If you can't get through your food, um, uh, then take a tablet because your bones are important. No, I think the AMS has uh, uh, an information sheet about calcium supplementation too. So that's the Australasian Menopause Society's website. Um, I think that's, been, that's been updated. Oh, great. Yeah, I did put yeah. a link to the Australasian Menopause Society on our recent newsletter and blog post so you can check that out. Um, okay, so we've got there's three big conversation themes that I'm seeing here that we could get to. One of them's around libido. Uh, one of them is about particularly a lot of questions, um, a lot of quite detailed questions actually about the use of prometrium that we could work our way through as a topic. Um, and there was something else here as well. There's uh, perimenopause and PMDD particularly. So I'll speak briefly to the one about perimenopause and PMDD and maybe um, you ladies could um, be thinking in the background about what you'd like to say about libido but um, if you wanted to have a have a look at our webinar on perimenopause I did do one with um, my friend Joe last year uh, about this time last year and one of the things we discussed in that was the fact that at perimenopause you have a very labile hormone environment so the way I like to describe it is that if your if your hormones your reproductive hormones are sort of up here normally during your reproductive years doing this on a fairly regular basis and then postmenopausally they're sort of going to be flatlined and much lower but that space in between is not just a, a gradual decline it's actually up and down all over the place like this and and the largest culprit there is the fact that you start to run out of eggs which means that you ovulate quite erratically so your your periods become intermittent your periods often become quite heavy Uh, one of the things that happens as a result of that is that you know you're getting all these wild fluctuations in both your estrogen and at times very low progesterone which impacts on your brain chemistry makes your brain chemistry very unstable and you can suffer quite badly with mood symptoms. Um, This is a book that Linda and I um, have been showing a lot of people, the Hormone Repair Manual, because it really nicely describes um, what happens in the hormonal environment at perimenopause and the reasons why it's not always just all about the estrogen. There is going to be times when you're actually relatively quite low in progesterone as well. And so we're seeing this enlarging role for body identical progesterone in the treatment of perimenopausal symptoms. Um, it can It's calmative, it's a bit sedative, it can um, help with perimenopausal women potentially if they've got premenstrual syndromes like mood disturbances and migraines and that's I use that sometimes just even by itself if a woman doesn't have strong indications for estrogen treatment say she's not getting a lot of really dreadful hot flushes or something like that so you know anyway that's just in a nutshell what's going on in the hormonal environment at perimenopause that impacts on your brain and causes a whole lot of instability emotionally as well. So PMDD is totally a thing. Don't let anyone tell you it isn't. And it can be absolutely devastating for some poor women. You know, I even hear from women who say that they are, you know, virtually suicidal once a month, which is just tragic. So, yes, definitely seek help if you're somebody like that. And, um, and you know, sometimes there's a role not only for hormonal treatments but psychology, meditation, apps, you know, um, antidepressants. All of these things can be more powerful together than any one thing by itself. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Now let's talk about sex. <laughs> Everyone goes, oh, don't ask me, don't ask me. I think libido, <laughs> my take on libido, my, my little spiel on libido, and I'm only going to cover a little bit, but it would be 
libido when it's not causing the woman loss loss of libido when it's not causing the woman distress so what we often see in relationships is a libido mismatch so men's libido seems to last forever and ever and ever and women's libidos drop off for various reasons and one of the um, biggest um, take-home messages I remember that if, if your partner shares the responsibility of housework, not helps out, but shares the responsibility of house, housework, they're likely to get more sex. And that, that there have been studies about that. So we do see this libido mismatch for a whole range of reasons. There's lots of things that you can do to talk about fixing that. But I think one of the things that a lot of women I've worked with have, have found really helpful, a lot of couples, have been to take up the um, concept of scheduled sex. So sex is an important part of a relationship for many people. So um, not everyone, but for many people and for many couples. So if it is that thing of your libido is not there, but you still want to be able to engage in intimacy with your partner, just schedule some sex in. So Friday morning, Sunday nights, whenever it works, that's when we have sex. Everyone knows we're going to have sex then. Well, you know, the two of you. And, and, and most women, even if their libido is low, can respond to arousal and still enjoy sex. And if that works, that's one great solution. So um, you can have a think about having that as an option. And Rosie King talks um, really widely about all the different causes. So I'm not going to go on that. But scheduled sex does work for lots of couples. Mm, absolutely it's um it's so important too I think because women come along saying oh there's something wrong with me I never want sex and they don't realize that that's actually absolutely normal like because you know they've been thinking all of the, all their life they've had spontaneous desire and they yeah. they just don't you know they don't feel that anymore and they so they think that they're abnormal but it's actually more normal to not have spontaneous desire after you know about 50 or 60 than it is to have spontaneous desire it doesn't mean you can't enjoy sex you just have to yeah. you know like you say you actually have to go um the desire sort of builds secondary to the opportunity and the engagement rather than the other way around yeah mm. so yeah absolutely believe in that and again the sexual problems um around menopause webinar and blog post from last year we do talk a, a whole bunch more about libido in that as well okay a um, couple more quicker questions I think here and then maybe we go into a bigger discussion around the use of prometrium and the various ways of doing that but um, if anyone wants to answer some of these uh, what is the role of HRT in low bone density well it's actually um, oh shivers oh. <laughs> we can hear Sorry. you Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Something's gone wrong with my computer. Hang on a minute. I oh, know we um, can hear and see you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry. Um, I think I realised for the first time during that menopause conference that you're allowed to use HRT as a primary, as your first line treatment for osteoporosis. Is that correct? Anyone else mm -hmm. pick that up? Yes. So that's very handy to know. So, um, and then I wasn't quite clear on the caveats about at what age you could begin because, you know, um, well, it's probably within 10 years of the last period, mm. which, um, I mean, it, it would reduce osteoporosis, improve it hugely, which is great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, can you go from oral continuous MHT to transdermal oestrogen over 60? Yes. And actually, I think that would be recommended. <laughs> I think for, for all my women who are over 60, I recommend a switch to transdermal in most cases um, because it's safer cardiovascularly and um, from a blood clot point of view as well. So um, I, it's recommended and easy to switch between the two. Absolutely. That sounds like good advice. Uh, what okay there's a couple of similar questions here one is what's your opinion on hrt in perimenopause and can you start it then and the other related one was perimenopausal woman with normal hormone levels on bloods would you start mht so i'm happy to address it and i think um i, I wanted to talk around that particularly because um really there's very few indications for blood tests and so um, I, I think it's important to realise that we treat you based on the symptoms that you tell us and um, taking a history. So it's not around tests. We don't 
there's very few times that we actually need a blood test. Um, those rare indications are when we're suspecting something called premature ovarian um, insufficiency or premature ovarian failure, which is when we're worried about um, early menopause or premature menopause under the age of 40. Um, so we don't we don't diagnose perimenopause or menopause based on a blood test. And so if you're over 40 and you have symptoms that are consistent with perimenopause or menopause, we don't need a blood test to confirm that. So you don't need a blood test from your GP and we don't mind whether you have or haven't had a blood test. In fact, we often hear so much about that. So don't get hung up on your blood test, whether your blood tests are normal or abnormal, because they're hugely variable. And what Kelly was describing earlier with the graph where she was saying that everything's fluctuating, that fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis. So you might have a blood test today and your hormone level might be completely normal and you might have a blood test in two days' time where your, your hormone level is completely abnormal. And there's so much fluctuation, it just is completely pointless. So don't worry about blood test level and don't be concerned if we're not doing blood tests because it really doesn't mean anything at all to us. In terms of the, the role of HRT or MHT in perimenopause, yes, absolutely. You just suffer and, you know, for a long, long period of time until you actually get to menopause and you've had 12 months of no menstrual period before you start menopause therapy. So, yes, the role of, of HRT or MHT is to start when you get to the point where you're, where you're having symptoms and you feel that there's um, something that we can do to help you. Um, and so that may be when you're symptomatic or, as the last question was, when you have something like low bone density, for example, and actually you don't have any symptoms, but we need to do something to improve things for you to reduce your risk of going. Hmm. Thank you. That was a lovely, a lovely answer for that. Um, I've got another one on a different theme here from Amanda. She's read that estrogen plays a role in supporting the sides of the bladder. So if our estrogen levels are low during menopause, you may experience more frequent urination as your bladder feels full. Which hormonal therapies will help with this as I'm at my wits end? I think that a little um, bit goes back. Sorry to button. You can. Uh, there you go. I think there a little bit. Go. I think that a little bit comes back to what I was asked when I, when I was talking earlier about the G, the GSM or genitourinary symptoms of menopause. So it's not just the sides of the bladder; it's also the urethra, it's also the vagina and the vulva. Um, so it's the bladder and all of the 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 tissues around the bladder and the urethra. Um, and so it's estrogen that you lose generally with the menopause, and it's the the loss of the the sort of the plumpness or the moistness and the, the thickness of those tissues that happen that happens with menopause and replacing estrogen either topically and locally, so that's using vaginal estrogen and using some estrogen to the urethra, for example, if you're putting cream down there, um, or using systemic estrogen, which is using either oral or transdermal via patch or gel. Mm. Sorry, Amanda. No, 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 that's exactly what I was going to say. So pelvic organs are very, very estrogen dependent and when your estrogen levels drop, uh, they become much thinner and much more um, sort of unstable. So mm. even if you don't want to take systemic hormone therapy or menopausal hormone therapy, just a local estrogen can do an awful lot to improve your frequency and that sort of, um, sort of ir irritation, uh, yeah, just improve bladder stability yeah and there are some situations depending on the type of cancer that a woman's had um, even where a woman might be able to enter a discussion with her um, oncologist about using vaginal estrogens for really dreadful vulvovaginal symptoms because there's such low absorption of the estrogen into the bloodstream so it's you know potentially not going to be um, too much of an issue for the any recurrence of their cancer or that sort of thing um, okay, someone's um, mentioned raloxifene. Celia's mentioned raloxifene, um, that it slows bone loss. Do any of you ladies know much about Evista? No? Uh, Evista, I, I, I don't use it that much, but my understanding mm -hmm. is it, so it's a selective estrogen, estrogen respect. Bleh. Okay, try that again. Selective estrogen receptor modulator or CIRM, which is a class of drugs that it's not actually a hormone, but it selectively will stimulate um, hormone receptors in various different type parts of the body. And um, the type of CIRM 
um, varies in, in its actions on which type of receptors. Uh, for raloxifene, it sort of specifically targets bone, I believe, without stimulating breast. And so um, there, it, it has a role, you know, potentially in improving bone density without increasing breast cancer risk. So that's, um, you know, that's the role that that sort of plays, I think. Okay, now we've got, again, lots of questions here about the use of MHT. Uh, oh, somebody said, uh, um, do you have to have lots of symptoms to start MHT or can you have just a few? Would anyone like to speak to that? I don't think there's a sort of, you don't have to have lots of symptoms. I think if you've got a few and they're bothering you and... Um, uh, you want to give HRT a go and there's no uh, contraindications, then it's worth having a try. And if you feel better, that's fine. You don't have to have a whole host of symptoms to benefit from MHT. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we've made the point a few times, haven't we, um, to, to patients that as long as they're quite young without any contraindications and they're doing all that they can to mitigate their risk factors in their lifestyle, it's actually very safe to try a bunch of things you know uh, we we often will use uh, these different products off label for a variety of different symptoms if they're if it seems like they're likely to be hormone related and there's a chance the woman's going to feel better so it's not always strictly by the medical indications which would be debilitating hot flushes or osteoporosis if you were talking the strict medical indications for mht right um, okay. Oh, we're getting some love here on the on the chat box, which is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much for the kind comments. And um, yeah, uh, who is it? Uh, Annalise says Dr. Long's Christmas necklace is ace. <laughs> very cute. Yeah, yeah, it is very cute. Now, um, we've got a big topic to open up here. It's the elephant in the room because we got a bunch of, um, you know, from, from our favourite girls on the Facebook group, they've sent through a bunch of questions about the use of Prometrium. So are you up for it if I start reading through those questions one at a time? Now, just to fill you ladies uh, who are watching in on the background of this, um, as we mentioned earlier, Prometrium is a progestogen um, and it actually is body identical progesterone, in fact. So it's exactly the same molecule as what your body produces naturally during it, the second half of its reproductive cycle. And we can now prescribe it as um, the agent to be used to balance out estrogen when you're doing combined MHT. But there are different ways that we sometimes use it. So, for example, if, um, if somebody needs to have a regular bleed because they're still perimenopausal and they haven't stopped having periods, we might use it cyclically, like two weeks on, two weeks off or something like that. Then if they got dreadful symptoms, nausea, breast tenderness, bloating, mood symptoms, we might either swap them to something else or even suggest that they could try and using it vaginally, which is very directly and well absorbed um, to use as you know, something to help thin the lining of the uterus down, but without so much absorption through your body um, that can cause some of those unpleasant symptoms, which is why it's done that way. Even though it's technically off-label, um, that's another way to use it and the specialists often do. So some of the questions that we've been posed here is to please explain the importance of a progester progestogen in the MHT regime for a woman with a uterus. I think we've just done that. How quickly is Prometrium absorbed vaginally? Um, so how do we need to make, how long do we make certain that we are lying down after inserting? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? It's a, uh, I mean, it's absorbed. I think it's like absorbed into your bloodstream is kind of like six hours or something, isn't it, on average? Mm -hmm. And in terms of... Do, do, is the question more about when does it dissolve? I think they're just worried if they stand up, it'll dribble out. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it, it, can, it can dribble out a little bit, so it's kind of best done when you're last thing at night so that you're kind of horizontal in bed. Um, mm. uh, but, it, you know, your, your vaginal walls aren't, it's not an open cavity as such, they collapse on each other, so they will have some degree of holding it there. Mm. I guess mm. if it turns into a liquid, it's possible a little bit will dribble out, but most of it would be absorbed in that situation, I would say. Yeah, so that comes into the next question. How far do we need to insert it vaginally? Some of us have short fingers and struggle to get it in a long way. Um, you know, I don't think you need to, like, 
push it right up into your belly button or anything, but um, it is, you know, j- typically if you were using Prometrium vaginally and you were using a vaginal estrogen, my understanding is the Prometrium goes up higher and towards the back and, and then, then you would insert your estrogen pessary after that sort of lower down. Is that right? Hmm. Yeah, but I don't think it's an exact science. I don't think you need to overthink it too much. I think they'll be absorbed if you just get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any harm to inserting Prometrium vaginally but then shortly afterwards um, getting freaky with your male partner? Is there any harm if they get some on their penis? No, no yeah. problem. That's fine. <laughs> it's better. It's better if you can absorb it into you because if it's if it's on them, it's not in you. But it's it's not going to do any harm. Just wash it off afterwards, as well. I would say no, no yeah. drama. Yeah. yeah, sounds fair. Why must patches only be used below the waist? Some doctors and pharmacists advise it can go on arms, rib, rib cage, or under breasts. Who is right? My my understanding is the only reason is is if if it's above your waist, it's an increased risk of breast tenderness. So they advise mm-hmm. it to be below waist for that reason. Uh, ideally, a non hairy skin. Um, mm-hmm. for better- mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, this next question speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, even amongst us who prescribe Prometrium very regularly, there is differences in the way um, that we might advise women to use it. And why is that? Um, my, My answer to that would be that you know, the evidence shows that a certain amount per month of prometrium is required to balance a certain amount of estrogen. Um, How that is achieved is more about what's practical for the woman in and around her um, menstrual cycle, what's easiest for her to remember, Um, you know, the fact that if she's bleeding all over the place and it's too difficult, you know, to find a point in her cycle reliably to, to track it so I've noticed this you know at our clinical meetings that everyone sort of gives slightly different advice at times but it's just in response to the individual woman and what's easiest and what is going to work best for them Um, does anyone have any more thoughts about that I think that reflects the fact that the international literature doesn't um, have a set guideline. It doesn't say that it must be 12 days per month or it must be 14 days. The international literature and the international guidelines, um, you know, says, you know, somewhere between 12 and 14 days per month. So we will all have slightly different advice around that. And some of us will say, you know, use it from day one to 14 of the month. And some of us might say use it from day you know, 12 today, whatever of the month. And I think we work with our individual patients, as Marita says, to listen very carefully as to what's going to work best for our individual ladies, um, knowing how much brain fog is there, what's going on in their lives, what's happening with their bleeding, and try and work out what's going to work best for them. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and the other thing, there was a bit of controversy even amongst ourselves. There was uncertainty there uh, about, you know, some of the specialists are saying that when you use it vaginally, you can use half as much. So, you know, for example, instead of using two capsules orally in the second half of the cycle, you might use one vaginally. That is routinely done by some specialists. Um, you know, the, the literature is very unclear. We just don't have the evidence to show that that's a safe thing to do, but we also don't have any evidence to say it's an unsafe thing to do and you know I think you know in this in this area I do always um, think about you know the level of specialists who are and what they're doing and and what they're accepting of but I, I don't I think it as you say it's an inexact science as long as we're doing the safest thing and if we get abnormal postmenopausal bleeding that persists that we're doing ultrasounds to monitor that the lining of the uterus is still looking normal so we're keeping an eye on it not not discounting the possibility that something else could be going on yeah um a body a few questions. Oh, there are a few questions about the continuous and cyclical and i just wonder if it's yeah. worth mentioning how we kind of make those decisions yeah go for it so i guess you know we often start women on cyclical um courses when they're perimenopausal or newly menopausal and the main reason for that is to avoid you getting unscheduled bleeding so that's random bleeding so there's no reason why you can't start on continuous 
But the downside is that you might get this unscheduled bleeding. So often we say that, you know, why don't you just try the cyclical to start off with for 12 months, just keep that regular um, withdrawal bleed, and then in 12 months' time let's switch you to the continuous and then see how things go. So there, there are some women who really don't want to have a, they don't want to risk having a regular bleed, so they, they choose to start continuous. Some will be fine, but some will end up with unscheduled bleeding. We might have to then go back to the cyclical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's always worth remembering that in the first six months of any new or any change mm-hmm. to your HRT, it's really common to get bleeding. So I do let let women know that so they don't freak out, particularly if they've been, you know, not having any periods for a few yeah. years. Um, it can be a bit scary if you all of a sudden start to bleed and you're not expecting it. So it's not uncommon. It usually settles down or it just means we've got to change yeah. what we're doing somehow. So don't um, be afraid to ask your doctor questions if you're not sure, you know. Absolutely. Just say, I'm not sure why we're doing this because sometimes we assume that people know. Mm. Yeah. Um, body aches. Often it, MHT is really helpful, but what else is proven to assist and what do you see that regularly helps women with body aches? Uh, there are many products, but they're so expensive. And what really works? Exercise, turmeric, green-lipped muscles, testosterone. So, yeah, body aches and pains. Any thoughts, ladies? Let's go to the ultra marathon runner. <laughs> yeah, I, I reckon you must hurt sometimes, Anna. <laughs> That's why I run ultra marathons. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think it's important that there to recognise that there is a lot of um, products available and we are trying to recommend things that there is evidence for. We don't want people to be using things where they potentially are going to suffer financial harm and I guess secondarily potential harm in terms of side effects or issues with liver dysfunction, for example, um, where they're not going to be gaining any benefit. So um, we want to recommend things that are going to help where there's good evidence for it. And so we know, for example, that exercise can help with symptoms, and that is both aerobic exercise and resistance-based exercise. But it's important to recognise that resistance-based exercise, particularly if you haven't done that before, needs to be taken very slowly and carefully in the beginning because it can increase some pain initially. Um, So you'd want to do that with the assistance of an exercise physiologist or a physio. Um, And then um, hormone replacement therapy, you know, has good evidence for helping around that. Linda, any other thoughts? Magnesium. um, Magnesium um, can be helpful, um, but it's making sure that you're using the right type of magnesium. Um, Any other thoughts, Linda? Uh, No, I... um... So perimenopausal women do and menopausal women do tend to get aches and they do get better when they take MHT. So that must be a shift of the hormones or the um, the tissues Mm. just becoming estrogen deficient. Um, But body aches and pains in general are helped by keeping moving. So I would say exercise, exercise, exercise. That's just not in the perimenopausal, menopausal time. If people have got sore knees, sore hips, sore backs, there's loads and loads and loads of evidence that, you know, Mm. Exercise, exercise physiologists, physiotherapists yes. therapists that make all the difference. Yep. So um, I would say uh, moving is the, the most important and then if you want to do MHT, um, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Panadol and not st- strong painkillers. Like in general practice mm-hmm. you come across so many people so they move from Panadol to Panadine to Panadine 4 to Endo to Lumicat. They mm-hmm. all still have pain. They have just makes no difference at all so yep. just go the moving go the mht if you yep. want have it off. that's it Yep, see a physio. If you're somebody who's on that, that cocktail of painkillers, they should be really seeing a, a pain specialist and, and getting that sort of multidisciplinary approach um, to that because, you know, there's a lot of psychology around pain, isn't there? And, and, you know, sometimes if a person lives with chronic pain because they've been sensitised, like our ladies who have chronic pelvic pain and things like that, um, you know, 
it's really difficult thing to get your brain to accept that just because it's feeling pain doesn't necessarily mean that there's harm occurring or that it's dangerous and sometimes you know you have to push through and still um, make yourself exercise even and, and accept a certain level of pain if you're somebody like that so yeah definitely get good multidisciplinary advice see physiotherapists um, and um, and you know just keep just keep looking for answers there but absolutely exercise within the limits of your pain and be prepared to push through it a little bit if it's um, if it's some sort of situation like that I think um, okay so I've had a question from Veronica about histamine intolerance at perimenopause now I know this is a theme that I read in the hormone repair manual book that Lara Bryden did she's a naturopath um, who has very good sort of academic explanations for, for what goes on in the body at perimenopause. And it does seem like we have a heightened histamine response. Does, and does anyone have any comments about that, you know, the, the, the role of um, histamines at perimenopause and how to manage it? Um, there's the other person to, to Google, Veronica, there is Dr. Tina Piers in the UK. And she's, if you Google her name, she's got some really good info on um, histamine intolerance and uh, menopause and MHT as well. So that's another thing that you could read. Um, my understanding is it's quite a broad topic, but um, women who do have histamine intolerance, uh, increasing estrogen actually increases histamine. So it can you know, all respond so well to MHT and they can be quite sensitive to progesterones as well. Um, so around, they think between one and three percent of us have undiagnosed histamine intolerance um, to do with the enzymes that break down histamine. Um, but the best MHT to try is, again, the transdermals and the micronized progesterones um, and, and just have a good read about um, lower, lower histamine diets. Um, taking antihistamines can help. But there is some information out there. I think uh, Louise Newson, as you mentioned, has um, some good stuff, but also Tina Pears, and then um, the Hormone Repair Manual, as Kelly said, as well, is worth a read as well. Mm, great answer. Thank you for that. Um, all right, what else have we got? There's still a bunch of ones that we didn't get to about progestin sensitivity. I'm just scanning through to see what other themes we've got at the moment. Are there any things um, amongst you ladies um, there that you think are important topics that we haven't really broached tonight that you'd like to say any take-home messages on? Particularly, I know, Anna, the subject, you know, the, the, the importance of oestrogen. We had, um, we all wrote a little spiel about our time at the menopause congress and there were some fascinating things weren't there linda about epigenetic aging and the role of um you know the things that you can do in your life to to reduce your epigenetic age um but if you can think while i'm scanning through the questions here if anyone thinks of um a topic that we haven't really broached yet that's worth a mention please go ahead I'll just talk briefly around um, progestogen sensitivity um, just while Kelly's having a look. Um, I think recognising the difference between a synthetic progestogen, which is an artificial or man-made um, progestogen, uh, and a biological uh, progestogen. Um, so prometrium or micronized um, prometrium is a body identical, meaning that it's a similar or the same type of progester progesterone that your body has made itself. And so we recognize that um, that is the, um, a, a progester progestogen that you're more likely to tolerate with the least amount of side effects compared to a synthetic progestogen. And then we know that um, a Mirena, which is a local progesterone uh, progestogen to the uterus, is least is a low dose of progestogen that is the least likely to give you side effects. So if you're someone who is sensitive to progestogen side effects using a body identical prometrium or a Mirena, which is a local progestogen to the uterus is going to be the least likely type of progestogen to give you side effects and with the prometrium you have the option of using it orally or as Kelly's previously talked about using it vaginally. There was a question back earlier about um, with somebody who was using a cyclical MHT, which was the combination of estrogel and cyclical prometrium. Would you continue to get a withdrawal bleed slash period indefinitely if you stayed on a cyclical? Um, and the answer is, well, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, you know, I think 
it sometimes is that when we start women on a cyclical MHT regimen, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to judge when they're ready to go to a continuous regimen. It's a matter of working out when they've actually stopped ovulating. And as we explained earlier, sometimes it's not useful to do blood tests to sort that out. So, um, you know, sometimes if a woman's been on a cyclical MHT regimen for a while and is only having dead on, you know, the, the bleeds exactly when she was expecting for about six to 12 months, I'll go, you know what, let's try some continuous now and just see if you really need to be having periods anymore. Because otherwise, you just like being on the pill, you can induce a withdrawal bleed every month and give yourself the false sense that you're actually ovulating regularly, which you probably aren't. Mm. Um, so someone's also asked about um, autoimmune diseases and scleroderma with MHT. Does someone want to speak to um, the impact of MHT on autoimmune diseases? I mean, estrogen can be an immune um, immunogenic, so it can uh, prime your immune system a little bit. So there's theoretical risk if you've got something like lupus or something like that, it can make it a little bit worse, reactivate it. But in the vast majority of autoimmune conditions, things like rheumatoid arthritis, the, the benefits are far, thought to far outweigh the risks. Um, and certainly the ladies I've started um, MHT on, and I've, I've sometimes consulted with their rheumatologists, most of them are happy for us to start. But you do just need to bear in mind for some of the things like SLE, it's worth just getting that specialist um, rheumatology opinion um, in those situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so before we, um, we, we've sort of been going for an hour and 15 now, and I just wanted to say something briefly, because I know some women will be starting to turn off and have to go off and, you know, like have dinners or get kids to bed or something. But um, I did want to say, again, thank you all very much to all of our audience, all of the Wellfem community for supporting us so much during the last 12 to 18 months. It's been a huge period of growth for Wellfem, and we've been so incredibly lucky lucky that we've gotten Medicare rebates for our patients now, which has been able to um, make it accessible to so many more women. Now that we're at this, this growth point, we actually have six doctors. Unfortunately, Dr. Spencer couldn't make it tonight to be with us. Um, so now that we're at this point and we've still got so much work to do in educating GPs, in helping to, you know, alleviate unnecessary suffering of women who have got dreadful menopause symptoms all around the country. So um, we're calling on you guys again to please help us get the word out there to make sure that we keep the demand going, that Wellfem can keep doing the work that it's doing. And one of the best ways you can do that is to keep talking to the other women around you about your menopause experiences identify the ones that are suffering needlessly and let them know about Wellfem. And I'm going to be sending out an email, which you may have already received, in fact, um, just asking you to please think about referring a friend to Wellfem. And for those of you who do refer a friend who books a premium appointment, just let your doctor know next time you're doing a review appointment and we'll refund you $20 as a way of saying thank you for doing that. So again, thank you so much. I just, before some of you start to clock off, I just wanted to get that in there to say thank you for all your support. We love you and we just want to make sure that this service continues to exist to help as many women as we can. Now, where are you all at, ladies, um, my five doctors here? Um, are you happy to keep taking a few more questions yet? Just let me know if you need to, to log off. I'm happy right. to keep going to my yeah. Happy to keep going. Okay. So there were still some more questions that we didn't quite get to with the prometrium and things like that. But also um, also about monitoring of women who've had adeno, adenomyosis, endometriosis, fibroids who are on MHT. Should they be scanned regularly? What do you do when you're giving your MHT to somebody who's got a history of fibroids or bad endometriosis? Do you sort of routinely scan them or do you wait to see if, if symptoms develop? I mean, oh, yeah. I, you go, okay. I was just going to say with, with endo, it, it's important to remember that even if you've had a hysterectomy, you can still have pockets of endometri endometriosis within the pelvis. So um, in general, it's it's probably a good idea to consider having progesterone as well, particularly if you've had a, a recent um, a recent op, and if the um, endometriosis was kind of more extensive in the pelvis um, too. So just because you've had a hysterectomy doesn't mean you shouldn't have the prometrium. Um, I would say, 
Um, estrogen can uh, cause fibroids to grow. So if someone, I, I always warn people that might be might be the situation. And if we're a little bit unsure, they're worried. Sometimes I scan if, if you know, after discussion, maybe three or four months in, but not routinely, only if, if people want mm. to have that plan or we're worried for any reason. But I don't, I don't worry too much about endometriosis provided they've got the progesterone on board as well. Mm. Yeah, and I sometimes warn people, as you do, Katie, um, you know, that it can stimulate those those tissues. And um, if it's lower grade endo and we're not using Prometrium right from the outset, we, you know, but they start to develop pelvic pain, I warn them to report that pretty quickly so we can start some. Yeah, another question came in before about how long you can continue to use Prometrium. Um, the five-year thing came up. Um, I know we've all heard that before that women's GPs have said, oh, you have to come off it now because you've been on it five years what do you say to that Linda do you how do you answer your ladies on that one um I mean the risk of uh, so we're talking about the risk of breast cancer here really I mean it's very small after five years even so I just mm. compare the risk I mean the overall risk of breast cancer is one in seven regardless I mean it used to be one mm. in eight uh, doubled by being overweight, increased by 50% by not exercising, decreased a lot by exercising, increased by, um, you know, I mean, moderate alcohol use, so two drinks per day. Those are much bigger risks than having um, HRT for five years or more where you increase by it's two per thousand per five years. It's not much. So it's very small compared to, to the risk of um and not exercise uh, of being overweight, which is forty five mm -hmm. per thousand. So you just mm -hmm. have to. I mean, it's up to the woman. So what, what they mm -hmm. want to do, and women have their own ideas. So some women want to try stopping, like Anna said, and they might find their symptoms have gone. Other women, and they just um, titrate themselves down. Mm -hmm. Other women run out of their scripts and they find they're okay. Other women, um, you know, just kind of keep going and. Mm. I mean, we used to say, the Menopause Society used to say at age six, you know, benefits outweighed the risk until age 60 and then we didn't know. And so I sort of do have a bit of a talk at age 60 and see where people are at, but usually they want to keep going and that's mm. it. So, um, I mean, now they say continue as long as, you know, you kind of feel you need it, you're happy with it and I guess I'm happy to go with that. It's a mm. very, very small risk, increased risk, but, I mean, it's there and it's the risk you have to wear patient has to wear um but it's small compared to other uh, lifestyle factors yeah absolutely um one other question relating to the uh progesterone was um that at the higher doses of hrt um do they need to increase the level of progesterone um accordingly and uh, you know there's just it's an evidence-free zone as we know unfortunately we really don't have good studies to show what the right amount of progesterone is to balance higher dose levels of estrogen so myself my I take a pretty cautionary approach by proportionately increasing the amount of progesterone so if they're on 50% more estrogen I give them 50% more progesterone um, there is no evidence to support that I'm just doing it to play it safe and I would always um, you know recommend probably you know in the first couple of years getting an annual pelvic ultrasound just to make sure that we're doing it right um, does anyone have any different approaches to that um, so. Okay, I think we're all getting a little bit tired. <laughs> Some of us have been seeing patients all day as well. So we might wrap it up there. But look, again, I just want to thank all of you beautiful Wellfemme uh, community ladies for joining us tonight. Thank you so much again for your support. We're all here because we just wanted to give you an opportunity to, you know, get to know us a little bit better and ask us in free form whatever you like. Um, so thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful, safe, happy, Merry Christmas and an ass kicking 2022, huh? <laughs> right, shall we finish it there? Yes, All righty. All right. Hey, Good night, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>